Welcome to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Each week on this program, Jeff and his guests share their expertise, personal anecdotes, and the latest industry news to keep you in the loop. Now to provide you with insight and help you navigate the consistently changing world of real estate lending, here is your host for The Mortgage Voice, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for watching the show, either on YouTube or whether you listen to us on all the famous, the Big 8 podcast. Daryl, you want to run through that list for us again? Thank you. Oh, sure. Of course. It's uh, Apple Podcast. We've got uh, music, Google Music Play, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Radio.com, and YouTube. Okay, these are all the major brands in the podcast area. I'm very happy to be on all of those particular podcasting uh, outlets. Uh, it gives us a great reach, a good voice out there. And we add to the many voices who are trying to help people along in the mortgage industry, in the real estate industry. And so again, thank you very much for listening. We're on five different radio stations. We also do a daily uh, on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. Uh, the Facebook is Malibu Funding at Yahoo. What is it? MalibuFunding.net. Is that what it is, Daryl? It is. Okay. And that's the show. Uh, that's the company rather that sponsors this show as well as the uh, daily minute or five minute on LinkedIn and YouTube on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. There, there are a few shows out here like this, but in the podcast world, you've got to have people looking for you and uh, accepting you and wanting to listen to you in order to help other people. And that's kind of what we're all about. YouTube, same thing. Go there, sign up, sign in. Uh, Jeff Barton, the mortgage voice is on YouTube. And of course, the, the five different radio stations plus FM affiliates that we're on from Albuquerque, New Mexico, all the way up to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada in Southern California in the Inland Empire, a couple of stations there and up in Tahoe uh, and to that great station up there, K Tahoe. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, it's not easy, by the way, trying to keep up with what's happening all the time in the mortgage industry. The reason is, is because we have daily fluctuation of rates. It costs differently each and every day. Some days are, are better, some days are worse. Last week we had a worse uh, situation happen whereby FHFA raised their particular fees uh, and going from 25 basis points to 50 basis points. Now what does that mean? It's a half a point is really what it is. So if I have a $100,000 loan, and it's a half a point. One point is a thousand, so that'd be five hundred dollars on a on a hundred thousand dollar loan. That's fifty basis points up from two hundred and fifty dollars, twenty five basis points. Now maybe that doesn't mean anything to the hundred thousand dollar borrower, but if you're a five hundred thousand dollar borrower, you, well, you figure it out. That's twenty five hundred dollars. Now twenty five hundred dollars added to closing costs is the equivalent of adding an eighth to a quarter of a point to your rate. And that's an important deal. That's why all the rates last week went up by a quarter point. Now, we have seen this week rates settle back down again. Very odd circumstance in what happens. This is why keeping up to date with what happens in the mortgage industry on a daily basis is so important. You're out there, you want to buy, right? Now, I'm also a real estate agent. I do some of that work uh, for a company called... Uh, Bridgeport Real Estate uh, here in Southern California. Now, that particular unit, um, and because of the fact that COVID has changed the way we do our job and how we do our job, but it's a million dollar unit. Let's figure it out, right? So in many respects, if you're getting a loan on a million dollar unit, 20% down, it's $800,000 loan. Okay, so you might see uh, fees on that particular loan go up. The rates definitely went up. And on a quarter point over a 30 year period, that could be closer to $100,000 or more that you're going to be losing just because the rates went up. So it's very important to make sure that when you're in a situation where you have confidence that the rate you're looking at or you're being offered is something you can afford, make sure that you ask the, the lender, the mortgage broker, the person you're dealing with, if this is a good time to lock, if it, now is the time to lock. Obviously, the payment that you can make based on the lock is extremely important. Now, a lot of banks, a lot of lenders will allow you to lower the rate if the rate actually gets lower, i.e. relock the, the rate. Now, there may be some redisclosures that have to go out and it may delay your particular closing, but if you're kind of drop rate by anywhere from an eighth to a quarter, I think it's worth it. 
And I think anybody who is a seller who wouldn't understand that, it really is a, you know, somebody that you should talk to a little bit, maybe give them a little uh, added incentive, i.e. I'll close, you know, with uh, a minimal delay once we get the new loan lock. And those type of things are really important. So anyway, thank you very much for showing up and suiting up and uh, watching what we do. I was just talking to Daryl off air about the, the craziness out there. And it's because here in, so, in most of the West, right? Let's just talk of the Western United States. It is really hot. And the heat brings out things in people, uh, especially out here uh, in Southern California that you just might not normally see. You combine that with the stay at home that most people are still doing, mask wearing and such, uh, the, the, the violent vitriol that you see either online or on television due to the political you know, uh, season that we're in, which is the presidential and um, congressional election season. And uh, it's, it's a bad mix. And so if you're out there and you're feeling sort of, I don't know, melancholy is the wrong word, but you have some angst, you're not alone. And it, as a result of that, what we have in, in many respects in the housing market is nervousness as to availability of housing, where are the rates going to go because of FHFA increased their fees, and overall, can I keep my job? There, there's a survey out, and I wanted to get to it just uh, before I do something else. Okay, so uh, the Census Bureau put out a uh, survey, and it is about American households and the pandemic data and the key takeaways from this particular survey. There were six points, I'll, I'll rush through them here. The main point of most of the survey uh, was about lost earnings, right? So they, they say that 127 million Americans have lost earnings. Now you think about that for a second. If we had 160 million people working at its height, 165 in that range, and 127 million of those 165 are feeling or know that their income is lost, well, that's, a, that's huge. Whether they've lost it outright, and, and the survey goes through that, um, the layoff, and, and they called it layoff nation, which I don't know why we need to tag everything with a name so that people remember it anyway. So uh, due to the coronavirus, 11.6 million people lost their jobs. The reduction in business, i.e. the employer says, hey, I'm not doing as well as I was, so I got to lay some people off, 10.2 million. Uh, Closed temporarily, restaurants, uh, retail, those type of people, eight and a half million. Not in school or daycare issues because the kids are now at home full time. That's 6.9 million issues. Now that's something I think we could do something about. And I think childcare in this country has really got to be one of the issues that we take up. I mean, I don't know about the, the coronavirus bill getting through Congress. I don't know about relief packages because quite frankly, I think there's no appetite for the president to do this. I think there's a divide in people that think it should be done, people that don't think it should be done. And I think the people who think it should be done, um, you know, may outweigh the people who don't think it'd be done, but th there's no deal to be made here because there's, there's an expectation of a negotiation back and forth. And I don't think the two sides can come together. Otherwise they already would. I wish they would. But one of the issues that I think we got to take up in the new Congress or whether there's a new president or the old president is what about child care? And the people that need child care are the two family household that have to go out and earn a living. So that's extremely important. And in this particular case, 6.9 million people who need child care can't because they got to stay home and watch the children. Uh, concern about getting coronavirus, 6.1 million. Uh, and the people who are sick, 3.2 million. Now, we know it's about 5 million people in the U.S., and we probably have a million, million and a half people who have uh, gotten better. Uh, we have 160, 170,000 people who have died. So these are the way the numbers um, sort out and, and how we're dealing with it. But what this sentiment survey shows us is that of this 127, it's broken down like this, and what are some of the other major concerns or P of people who have lost their job, who need to get back into the market in order to get the economy moving again? They talked about eating out being one of the issues. They talked about mental health, and I want to talk about that in, in a segment later on in the show. I think mental health is probably one of, and it's an indicative of whether you're older or younger, 
the state of your mental health. And, and we're going to get into that and how that affects the economy and how that affects housing. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in. And uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much for tuning in each and every week. We're on a number of different podcasts, as you know. We're on YouTube, Jeff Barton, the Mortgage Voice. And we're on several different radio stations from Albuquerque, New Mexico, up to Las Vegas, Nevada, in the Inland Empire, Riverside, San Bernardino, and also up in the Lake Tahoe area. And thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, The show reaches a lot of different people. Need for what we offer each and every week change. Uh, The reason is, is because, hey, if you just got a loan last week, you're probably not that interested. However, the real estate market is uh, an interesting, it's in an interesting time. Uh, The loan market uh, is obviously doing the same thing. Offering of products is changing constantly. And so I decided once again to bring back an expert in that area. Uh, Ciro De Palma from Commerce Mortgage is nice enough to come on to the show. Ciro, how are you? Good. How are you doing there, Jeff? I'm great. Thank you very much. And the hot weather has finally arrived here in Southern California. Oh, my gosh. The people on the freeway are driving me cuckoo. Yes, it definitely is hot out there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about commerce and what you guys are offering and some of the solutions you might be able to offer borrowers uh, out there who are looking for a loan. Certainly. So uh, we're commerce, wholesale, home mortgage, and we're located down here in uh, Irvine, California. Uh, we're offering the traditional Fannie and Freddie products, uh, 625 for conforming and high balance loan limits, 510 for the Inland Empire, and 765 for the Orange County and L.A. markets. Um, We're also offering uh, FHA and VA, um, some niches that we do there. We do down the FICO scores uh, uh, 580 for both uh, conforming and uh, high balance on both markets. And we also offer some niche products for no FICO streamlined. So basically what that does is qualify the borrower. They might have a, a lower FICO score as long as they have a uh, pay this agreed mortgage for 12 months. We'll just go off their mortgage rating and qualify them for the best possible interest rate available. Uh, do, me, do, do me a favor, uh, Cyril. Could you explain a little bit about how uh, rising fees uh, from FHFA has affected um, your doing business? Did you have to raise rates last week as everybody was trying to scramble to figure out what to do? Uh, yeah, so FHFA went over and uh, raised their overall uh, refi adjustment, uh, 50 basis points on all loan programs. Um, mm-hmm. So with that being said, we would, along with all the other lenders in the marketplace, did have to increase our margins on those uh, by the 50 basis points across the board. Um, so it did make lending for a borrower a little bit more expensive. Okay, and, and that is added into the APR, right, in terms of uh, fixing all the loan estimates. So did a lot of loans have to come back and get, re, um, I guess, redisclosed? Uh, for, for those that were uh, locked, it did not affect any loans that are locked. Any loans that moving forward um, from that day, it was just it would be redisclosed based on the new lock terms. Correct. I see. Okay. Uh, pr- the product that's moving the most with commerce is what? I say we have a, a variation of all programs. To be honest with you, our, our pricing is uh, priced very aggressive for the um, conventional market. And then with our uh, programs offering um, for FHA with the lower tiered FICO scores, a lot of lenders only go down to 620. We're getting a bulk of those as well. Uh, the, the, the fi- are you going down to 580? Is that what you said? Yeah, we go down to 580 uh, for the for the FHA and VA, correct. Now, I know that FHA doesn't have a, a FICO score limit, and, and you guys are going as going down to 580. What, what determines that for most lenders? What, where they uh, put their ceiling is just their level of risk or uh, comfortability, or, or what is that? It's actually the risk and the comfortability. Um, I would say that uh, we have a, a threshold of wanting to help maybe those who have a lower FICO score or a lower income threshold. So we want to go ahead and lend on some of those loans as long as it makes sense and the borrower qualifies. 
Now, do you, do you do any manual underwriting or is it most of the automated stuff through DU or LP? Uh, we do require that it has to get a, a AUS approved eligible, so we don't do any manual underwriting. Uh, but we do see that borrowers do, uh, in fact, qualify with the lower FICO score of 580 on ASU approved eligible. Okay, and uh, one of the main things that we've been dealing with in COVID, as you well know, is the proof of income. Uh, and I know through the loan process, the underwriting process, there are several stages by which a um, uh, verification of employment goes out. How do you handle it there? For the verification of employment, so we will do the final verification of employment uh, for a W-2 borrower um, at CTC for at clear to close. Um, to make sure that they do have, do still have a job moving forward, so there's no issues there. Um, for the self-employed borrowers, we do need to require a year-to-date P&L, profit and loss statement, along with two months current bank statements to ensure that their income is still sufficient from what's being filed on the tax return from previous year, 2019. Okay, and on those um, uh, self-employed borrowers, what type of borrowers are you looking at? You're looking at mostly uh, uh, business owners, uh, and, and how are they verifying income? Is it just through the P&L or, the, well, as you said, is it a CPA letter? What else do you need? So they have a few different ways that they can do that. They can do what is called an audited uh, profit and loss statement. Um, with an audited profit and loss statement, they're not requiring any bank statements. But with a um, unaudited profit and loss statement, uh, they do require too much bank statements so showing sufficient income that they're using year-to-date along with uh, 2019 filed tax returns. Now, let me ask you, have you has your uh, uh, company ever gotten into the non-QM space? Uh, we were offering non-QM loans before the uh, pandemic did hit. Um, right. We don't have them offered currently, but it, there is talks about work, we are working on some non-QM products to hopefully issue out here in the next 30 to 60 days. Oh, I see. Well, that, that's interesting. And, and obviously, welcome news to those borrowers. Do you see the uh, income overall um, for, I guess, the unemployed? Do you see the unemployment? How does Commerce looking at unemployment in your area or in your borrowing pool? Um, honestly, we haven't seen too much of an effect as far as the uh, unemployed borrowers um, or say how state loans have gone through the pipeline and say in the middle of the transaction, borrower may have lost their job. Um, I haven't seen too much of that, to be honest with you. No, that's it. That's interesting too, because uh, we we follow it each and every week on the show. If we've had three and a half people, three and a half million people in forbearance, obviously there's an issue uh, with the the renters as well. So we always, you know, look for answers, solutions, whether it's in the non QM, whether it's hard money, or whether it's just in low FICO scores for FHA loans. Is that where you're basically trying to help this particular market or or segment of the market? Uh, yeah, we, we you know with the lowest. Uh, tiered FICO scores, and you know some of our lender fees are are much cheaper than what you'll see from the other lenders out there from a uh, competitive standpoint. Um, our lender fees are 599 for um, for any uh, conventional and FHA transactions, and 199 for any type of uh, streamlined transactions. Oh, that's very reasonable. Obviously, helps out uh, in both the APR as well as just the general fees and. Uh, for each and every loan. Would you mind shouting out your phone number for people who'd like to contact you directly if they if they have questions? Certainly. They can reach me at 949-351-8599. Uh, Cyril, thanks very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's been a long time coming and we finally got it done. Thank you. All righty, Jeff. Take care of yourself. And you too. This is Cyril De Palma from Commerce Mortgage. I'm Jeff Barton for The Mortgage Voice and we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for listening each and every week. If you do listen to us on YouTube, you can sign up, you can join, you can be a member. If you do that, it really helps a lot of other people find us. Information is timely, so if you don't get it this week, get it next week. The mortgage market changes all the time. Heck, last Thursday, it went from uh, one interest rate 
uh, 25 basis points higher the next day. Now that's one day, that's a big deal. Over a 30 year fixed rate loan, that's probably $100,000. So yes, you've got to pay attention, you got to look for it. Earlier in the show, we talked a little bit about how um, if you do pay attention, there's five, four or five different things that you need to look at and see in order to follow the mortgage market. But the reality is if you just go to a couple of websites and watch how it goes each and every day, follow the bond market a little bit, you'll be able to get a feel for yourself as to what's going to happen with uh, the interest rates either today, tomorrow, next week, next year. Uh, one of the things that we do on the show is we bring other financial experts to try to teach you and help you in your financial decisions, whether it's uh, long-term investment, whether it's uh, retirement, uh, whether it's you know any, uh, college money to uh, paying for a mortgage. Uh, with us once again, last week we cut short the interview a little bit, is uh, Terrell Robinson from Wealthwave. Big Tex, how are you today? Yes, how you doing? It's a day in the life. How you doing? It's a day in the life. Hey, could you shout out how people get in touch with you right off the top of the bat? I mean, I love your day in the life stuff, either on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram, wherever you're doing. How do people follow you? Absolutely. They can reach out to me at area code 702-882-2103. Again, that number is area code 702-882-2103. Okay. Yep, in regards to a day in the life, you know what? The most important part that they need to hear about is who do you want to protect your financial blind side? And especially at this point in time, the, the way the economy is going, uh, had so many clients reach out to me and still to this day re uh, reached out to say thank you so much because we thought it was funny when you told us three years ago, four years ago, or a year ago, but now it came to pass. Uh, so um, I just want to say, man, look, it's 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 been so phenomenal to be able to get so much uh, uh, of my clients uh, raising fans to call back to say thank you so much to be able to protect our financial blind side. And when I say Jeff, I haven't had not one client lose sleep, not one client lose sleep through all this pandemic that's going on right now in regards to their finances. Well, that's important, right? I mean, the whole idea, now, they, there was a, a survey that they did, and I referred to it earlier in the show, it talked about who feels, uh, I guess, uh, most anxiety, younger people or older people? Well, the survey said young people, obviously, they don't have a job, they don't have any financial security, and most young people have no idea how to plan for the future. I know you have helped young people do that by setting them up, and it doesn't even have to be a huge investment. Can you kind of explain that for the audience to hear so that somebody who is new, maybe in their 20s, can start to maybe sleep a little bit better about their long-term future? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the first look, the first thing is anyone that are uh, young people, let's just say 30, let's just say 35 and younger. Okay. Uh, 20 to 35 age range. The first thing we want to dial in, Jeff, is what is going out, assets versus liabilities. How much of your expenses in regards to a monthly basis, what's going out, what's coming in? Next thing we need to dial in is an emergency fund in case of a pandemic happens. Yep. And you lose your job. Will you be able to make your rent, your mortgage, your business payment for the next three, six, 12 months without having any issues or any interruptions? Then after that's done, let's look at, how are we going to start putting money away for your future? And I want you to look 10 years, 20 years, 30 years on that. This money is not to be touched unless it's some type of dire emergency. And I'm not talking about, oh, I got to get that new car or new shoes. But if you're going to purchase a home that puts you in a better position or something just fatal just came up that you need to use the money. So when we want to look at young people, their vision is microwave, meaning that they want that money real quick. Yep. So how can we stimulate their mind to make it fun and exciting? And so the old traditional way people will go would be like just regular, sorry, not regular term life insurance. Well, you're seeing a lot of young people move away from that because of it. But you got to understand if you're going to advise someone and they make a certain amount of money and they don't have a lot of cash or money set aside, but they have cured, uh, a student loan debt, a brand new car. Well, the most effective and 
inexpensive way is to even own a simple term life insurance policy. Heaven forbid something happens to that young person, all the debt could be wiped out. Parents, brothers, sisters don't have to worry about that. The next thing that we do is then we look at what's going on. Then we look at, let's take a percentage of what you are bringing home, and now let's put that away. Don't look at, hey, we have to put $5,000 away a month, because the goal for a young person is to take advantage of the compound effect. The rule right. of 72. Rule of 72 says whatever the interest rate that that client is making or whatever this, this account is making, you divide it into 72, that's going to tell you how, how many years it takes for your money to double. That's the goal, and that's the advantage that young people have that me at 44, if I was just getting started, don't have versus a 20-year-old. Right. So I take them through that process and show them the big picture. And you've got to educate them on, hey, this is what your life could look like if you follow these steps and you implement these steps. Right. This could be your life at the age of 55, 65, 70, whatever the case may be. And if you illustrate, when advisors illustrate that, their clients will follow the letter to the law. Hey, did, let me ask you a question. Motivation for people who are young that think they will live forever is low. How do you motivate somebody to take a path that will set them up for obviously retirement? You, you, you want to know the best way to motivate a young person is find out what are their goals and their dreams. So what I do is, what are your goals? What are your dreams? And then as your advisor, how can I help them get to their goals and their dreams? Hey. John, Jeff, I am here. Call me at any time. I'm here to help you reach those goals and those dreams. And once they see someone is there for them, that's when they'll start to take notice and then they'll get into action. And that's what's been the glue for me. And let's take, for example, my son. You know, he's 28 now, but when he was 21, my son bought his first home. He's already had a tenant. He flipped the property. He owns his second property. Got his emergency fund set up, paid off all his debt. He's pretty much debt free, except he just bought his spouse a new vehicle. But other than that, had no debt. But he was motivated by it because of the fact how can I help you attain and reach your goal? And mm -hmm. once we got that established, it became fun for him because now he's got a teammate that's going to help him. So that's what I do with young people. You have to, you have to. It has to be, the spotlight has to be strictly on them. And you, they have to know that right. you are in it for them to help them attain whatever it is that they need and want to achieve. Now, you live in Las Vegas, right? Correct. Okay, so you're talking about a business, about the excitement in your business, knowing that that's a city which has basically shut down. And this to me shows that in any, in any way, in any place, you can make business happen. Even in a city like Las Vegas, which is known for tourism and gambling, that it's completely shut down. You're not shut down because your business and your motivation keeps you moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the way I do so, Jeff, is because Look, those that have lost their jobs and looking for new jobs, they've been on the job for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they, if someone don't tell them that there still is light at the end of the tunnel, once right. we bring that to them and we show them to say, hey, there's still a way that we can set it up to where you basically become your own banker, and this is how we're going to do it. So when they see the excitement of, hey, they're still right at the end of the tunnel, and I'm going to have the option to be able to have income when I'm completely done, now they're back motivated again. They're not right. sitting waiting on a $600 a week check or $1,200 bonus or from the government. They're ready to go. They're, and so here's the thing. And here's the thing for everyone. I'm hey, mad. Hey, Terrell, I got I to gotta jump. I'm sorry. I want to have you back again to continue the discussion because this is at the heart of what we try to do on the show and what you try to do in your business. But I'm up against a hard break, so I got to go. I apologize for that. No problem, Jeff. This has been uh, Terrell Robinson, Big Tex from Wealthwave. Uh, Tex, thanks very much. Hey, thank you, Jeff. 
Have a great one. You too, buddy. And I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for listening. We are on the Big 8 Podcasts. And we are also on five, six different radio stations in three different states, from Albuquerque all the way up to Las Vegas, Nevada, the Inland Empire, and of course, up in Lake Tahoe. Uh, We are on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice, you can see this as well as many other shows. We've tried to stay current and update and daily. Uh, We do a LinkedIn as well as a Facebook show uh, for four or five minutes just to give you the daily of what's happening. I've actually had a tremendous response from the LinkedIn show, and I appreciate everybody who's out there who do, does listen to it. Uh, on Facebook, uh, Malibu Funding, that's the sponsor of the company, uh, the sponsor of the uh, show that we have. Uh, so if you go to malibufunding.net, you can see that. And also on LinkedIn, I believe it's just Jeff Barton, isn't it? Is that what LinkedIn, or is it the Mortgage Voice? It's uh, Jeff Barton. Okay, very good. Either one of those you can see daily, and of course, this particular show on YouTube and on the radio stations. Uh, we haven't heard from Ed Peisner in a number of months through COVID. You know, I've lost touch with a lot of the old regulars, but I wanted to bring him back on the show today because not only is he a terrific uh, person, great communicator, invested heavily in uh, internet uh, online security, as well as a, a business entrepreneur, but I think a lot of people who are trying to cope with what's going on out there need to hear what's going on with people who are actually doing it. Ed, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Dre. How are you? Um, you know what, I, I, I'm good. Uh, in, in some respects, I'm great. Uh, in others, I'm anxious and not really sure what to do with myself. And maybe that's, that's uh, what everybody's going through. What do you think? I, yeah, I, I think you're in good company there. I think so too. We talked off air about uh, you have a, a family, your son graduated from high school during COVID. Your daughter, we didn't, I didn't ask about her and how she's doing. Uh, but uh, raising children in this atmosphere is not simple. It's not easy. And uh, you've obviously got enough business and um, uh, nonprofit, I guess, uh, activities going on. Tell us a little bit about, about that and what's going on in the internet security in the name of the group that uh, you spearhead and continue to lead. Absolutely. So we, um, it's been around now for over a year, the organization for social media safety. Mm-hmm. And we are, as, as the name says, we're focused on social media safety as it pertains to children and adults. Our focus is, is in the school. Uh, obviously, COVID has put a halt to my traveling all over the country and speaking to students at school since they are no longer in school. Uh, however, we are in the process of actually shooting and taking one of our presentations and presenting it to schools and parents all over the country um, so that they can at least have access to it. Because, you know, screen time, we know too much screen time is a bad thing. And now they're being yep. to be staring at these screens. And with, with extended screen time comes bullying, inappropriate messages, uh, they have access to everything at their fingertips, and that's what we are afraid of. So the mm-hmm. Oregon Social Media Safety has, you know, with what we call buckling your social media safety seatbelt. Okay, give us, a, give us an example of some of the things that you're doing to educate parents and students alike, uh, young people, about the dangers. What are some of the examples that you might be able to give that would give somebody out there an uh, an idea of what they can do as parents, because I think a lot of parents are kind of lost in this area. Yeah, and you, one of the big things that we talk about are conversations, having having conversations with your kids before you phone over to your child, regardless of age. Now, obviously, the older they get, it's a different story, but we're talking teens and, and early teens. Having the conversations, the most important thing is defining what cyberbullying looks like, what sexual harassment looks like, what right. hate speech looks like, and, and having that open conversation and giving them the security to know that they could come to you as a parent to discuss it. Because it's not a matter of if they stumble across it, it's a matter of when they see it. 
is they will see it, and they need to know how to recognize it and what to do if it bothers family values or their community values, which we have seen all too many times. So we give them one part of my lecture is teaching them what to do when they see it, how they can report and block somebody, and it's, it's really their responsibility to report and block somebody. You know, the example I give is if I walked by your house one day, Jeff, and I saw somebody wrote something terrible on your garage door, it's my responsibility to let you know and, and, and go report that. It's the same thing with this device in your hand. We have to protect each other. You know, I uh, was reading, and it had to do with housing, but it, it talked about an age group, 18 to 24, and that one in four of this particular group during COVID has thought about suicide. I know that online there there is always some idiot encouraging somebody else to do something harmful to themselves. How do you deal with that when it's you know presented to somebody who is eight, 10, 12 years old, not someone who's older, which as you said, they're gonna run into it. How do they deal with something like that, especially if it to them seems you know new and exciting, which no, it isn't. Yeah, and unfortunately, you're right. Sadly, last year the statistics are suicide for teens, death by suicide was the second leading cause of death in our country, and mm -hmm. it, it is a number that is it is the second leading cause of death. If you keep me up at night thinking about that, yeah. obviously yeah. with us, we do tell parents and schools and faculty, everybody alike, they want to seek professional help immediately. But if a parent sees signs that they think is just your standard, typical teenage angst, you know, maybe withdrawing a little bit or the grades drop a little bit or, um, you know, they just seem more depressed, have to now ask the question, did something happen on social media? It's because the problem with social media, um, bullying and cyberbullying and all that is it doesn't stay at school. It follows them home. It follows them wherever they go. Right. With the phone. So it's parent really have to ask the question, you know, to, and listen, a parent has to say, I see your phone. They have to feel confident enough to ask it. And if the child says, wait, what? That's private. They have to understand mm -hmm. nothing is private on social media. Nothing is private. That's a good point, Ed. And I think that if you're going to give someone a phone, they have to understand the rules of what that phone represents. You are allowing the world into your life and you get to Thing in the world from the worst that is out there uh, to the best but for the most part because they don't have an ability to filter it through uh, they're going to be drawn to the, the salacious which is usually something that can get them into trouble absolutely absolutely well but I appreciate and applaud your efforts to deal with this this is all new social media is 10 years old right. we're all rooted. But again, I, I go back to the buckle of your seatbelt. You wouldn't stick your child in a car and say, hey, it's unsafe, but not tell them to buckle their seatbelt. And it's, it's making them aware of the dangers that are out there. They buckle their seatbelt because they know driving a car is dangerous. So we need to make sure they're buckling their social media seatbelt and they understand that there's dangers out there. Just about that conversation. What is a, a way by people can either donate or get in touch with you or follow this particular uh, issue with you? So our website is, you know, www.ofsms. It's just the initials for organization for social media safety. Ofsms.org. My email is at it, ofsms.org. But the, the website has all of her information, all my contact information there. Okay. And, and I, I, I know. Up there. You know we're, we're still on our mission of getting to schools across the United States. You know, COVID just sort of temporarily, you know, put us in hiatus. Right. And I think your idea uh, of putting a lot of this material online, being able to have people view it, at, uh, you know, because everybody's viewing, I mean, world is now online, either it's on Zoom or WhatsApp or FaceTime or any number of these applications. This is where the majority of us are spending our work day and obviously in our school day. So to have your ability to get online would, uh, you know, be a really uh, good thing for people who need the information. Yes, absolutely. And 
you know, I, I always have to tell everybody, I'm not saying social media is 100% bad. There's great, wonderful things that you can use social media for. It's just, it's that balance. It's making sure that we know our children, if they see something bad, they say something. Report right. and block and they do all the right things. Ed, thank you very much. We didn't get to the rest of what we wanted to talk about, but I'm very happy I was able to share uh, our brief time together talking about something that I know is very important to you and obviously to us here at the show. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. That's Ed Peisner, and I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry, and uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For questions or comments, send emails to info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for watching the show, either on YouTube or whether you listen to us on all the famous the Big 8 podcasts. Daryl, you want to run through that list for us again? Thank you. Oh, sure, of course. It's uh, Apple Podcast. We've got uh, music, Google Music Play, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Radio.com, and YouTube. Okay, these are all the major brands in the podcast area. I'm very happy to be on all of those particular podcasting uh, outlets. Uh, it gives us a great reach, a good voice out there. And we add to the many voices who are trying to help people along in the mortgage industry, in the real estate industry. And so again, thank you very much for listening. We're on five different radio stations. We also do a daily uh, on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. Uh, the Facebook is Malibu Funding at Yahoo. What is it? MalibuFunding.net. Is that what it is, Daryl? It is. Okay, and that's the show. Uh, that's the company rather that sponsors this show as well as the uh, daily minute or five minute on LinkedIn and YouTube on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. And so uh, given that what we're trying to do is talk about what is happening in the overall marketplace, what's going on in terms of trying to get you a loan, right? I mean, you're out there, you want to do a refi, you want to take some money out of your house because you're nervous. Maybe you're You've got a two-person ho household with uh, income and you're a little bit nervous. You'd like a little bit of a cushion. Well, you're not alone. Many, many people are trying to do the exact same thing, which is, which is good, right? I mean, uh, interest rates are really low. They're down to, you know, 3%. They were 2.5%. We went through that earlier in the show as the why, FHA, FA, uh, not why, but they did decide to uh, increase their fees from, you know, 25 basis points to 50 basis points, it's a half a point on your loan, $100,000 loan, half a point is $500. 500,000, it's $2,500. So that's a big jump in terms of the fees. Uh, and it, it really affects your APR and affects, you know, your rate. Uh, all the rates went up last week and they will, uh, we're not quite sure. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a creep down and we're not quite sure that the, the pressure from FHFA raising their fees is enough to continue to push rates higher or lower. But what we do know is uh, there are some uh, interesting uh, statistics and statistical analysis going along with what causes rates to rise, what causes rates to lower. Now, we've talked about it on the show several times, uh, and we talk about uh, the way by which rates are uh, quantified and qualified and how exactly those affect you and what you can do about it. Uh, so let's talk about, they talk about five different things that will affect the rate, right? We just saw one of the reasons, uh, government. Government will do things that will affect the rate, whether it's the Fed, whether it's the Treasury, in this case, FHFA. As soon as they raise fees, the rates went up by a quarter point. That's government. That's number three on the list. And so you can't control that. What you can control are some of the other issues uh, going forward. You can watch inflation, right? There is a, a thing called the inflation uh, target rate, and I think it's 2% during COVID. Now, why is that? Because when people make more money, that's really inflation, isn't it? I mean, if your salary goes up, that's adding to the inflation. So they say at a 2% rate, inflation is a good thing, meaning that prices will, raise, will rise slowly, but your income will also rise. So therefore, uh, hopefully your income outpaces the rise in costs of living, but that's what it is. And so uh, the inflation is one of the big five reasons that uh, rates go up. So uh, 
the Fed we mentioned, and bond market. Yes, we often talk about the Treasury Department and they sell debt, right? I mean, the entire world sells debt, any public company sells debt. And what does this really mean? It says, okay, I'm gonna borrow X amount of dollars today, but I will pay you X amount plus in the future. 10 years is usually the term by which we look at it in the mortgage market, the 10 year bonds. What are they trading at today? And are they up or down? If yields go up, usually so does the uh, interest rate on mortgages. Why is that? Because in order to entice people to buy US debt, you have to pay them something. If nobody's buying it, you have to pay them more. If you're paying them more, you gotta make more money on interest on loans that you're actually lending to member banks to lend out to you. It's a very simple formula, but that's one of the other things to look for when you're looking about long-term interest rates or short-term, what, what's my mortgage rate gonna be today? Another one is the, the economy, the overall economy. Usually if the economy is good, that means rates will be going up. If the economy is bad, i.e. right now, it has never been worse since the Great Depression. Uh, and as you all know, interest rates up until last week were at historic lows. And we've said that term 50 times in the last 18 months, but they were, they were, I mean, you were getting 30 year fixed rate loans at two and a half percent. Now that is a, that's really a tremendous rate. And you're getting FHA loans at uh, two and a quarter percent. And you're getting 15 year fixed loans at 2.38%. This week, they all went up a, a, a quarter to um, uh, uh, an eighth to a quarter. I would say that today because they came back down today a little bit. Um, and, and the last one is housing strengthening. Okay, the housing market itself, what's going on in the housing market? And why does this affect you? When there's demand for housing, as there is now, as there has been since the Great Recession in 2008, and that's a, that's a different discussion and we can hit upon it later. But when housing is in demand, the inflation on prices, obviously is the pressure for inflation, i.e. prices go up, is great because there's a lot of people that want houses they can't buy them or can't afford them. So the pressure on the price actually goes up uh, because scarcity makes you know, supply and demand. And that is exactly why housing right now is helping to dictate what goes on on your mortgage interest rate. If there is no demand on housing, if there is a buyer's market, and you know we, we have been in a buyer's market previously in 2009, 2010, they were giving properties away. They were bulldozing units in Florida. It was just, there were too many problems. However, because of that fact, we also saw the mortgage rates drop. So all of these five different things affect your mortgage rate. If you pay attention and look to all of these points, whether you search online, Mortgage News Daily, whether you uh, talk to your mortgage broker, mortgage lender, or you're um, somebody who's handling your investments, however that is, your stockbroker, your uh, real estate investment portfolio, or maybe it's just you're watching prices down at the local, local supermarket, whether they go up or down. These are the things that will affect mortgage interest rates, and these are the things that you can really watch. Um, now let's get to a couple other things. Uh, the forbearances dropped again to 3.6 million, uh, which is a good thing. However, 38%, 38% of that are initial foreclosure, uh, forbearance, not foreclosures, forbearance uh, issues, meaning that these people, 38% uh, of that number are now just getting into the forbearance, which means, yeah, that's not a good thing. 60% uh, are asking for extensions. So the 3.6 million figure is down from four and a half million in forbearance, but it's still a pretty big number. And you know why that 3.6 million, you know why that rings in, in my head? Because it's just about how many people, uh, 3.5 to four and a half million people who have COVID. Uh, we have 170,000 deaths, as we said earlier in the segment. Um, that's both big numbers, two big numbers, uh, but they are affecting real estate. They are affecting real estate prices because when people are afraid, it takes them out of the market either for selling or buying. Uh, where will the interest rate go? Okay, mental health. We talked about, let's touch about it again, touch on it again. The mental health issues, uh, 70.9 million adults uh, did not get their medical care that they needed. 
10% of adults considered suicide and one quarter of the age group 18 to 24 considered suicide during the last four, four and a half months. Now, mental health being what it is, and for this generation coming up right now, seems to be one of the bigger issues, has been. I have children. I know a lot of you out there that listen to the show. The reason that you want a mortgage is because you want to move in and you want to move your family there and make a better life for yourself. I understand that. And these are sobering statistics. Now, it's summer here in Southern California in the West. We've talked about it. It's hot. The, the anxiety levels are huge because there's such a fight about COVID, about mask wearing. Uh, there's also a fight because it's a political season and you know how people get when you start talking about politics, religion, or um, any name a couple, three other issues that would, would affect you. My advice, simple, stay focused on the now. Deal with what's in front of you and try to do as best as you can and pat yourself on the back each and every day. Give a hug to the ones you love. Those are the things that you can control. I can't control whether someone's losing it on the freeway again or someone just, you know, can't seem to handle the fact that making a decision right now is in their best interest, i.e. what mortgage rate do you want, right? Do you want today's rate, which may be up or down from yesterday's rate, but hoping for the best. There's, there's an old saying uh, that, uh, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show this week, and we'll see you next time. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. For more on today's topic, visit www.malibufunding.net.